Hi, tonight's guest on Green Party Alternative 2016 is Kent Mesplay. Kent Mesplay has uh, sought the Green Party ballot line for president uh, before. Uh, he's uh, been the former president of Turtle Island Institute, and I'll be asking him a little bit about that uh, because that's. Uh, Interesting. Also interesting is that he was uh, raised in Papua New Guinea, and uh, as someone who has been in a location like that, I'd like to find out how that has influenced his thinking in his relationship to the Earth and the Green Party. Uh, with that, uh, this is uh, Kent Mesplay. So, Kent, tell me a little bit about, uh, first, your growing up in Papua New Guinea. What was it like there? And how did that influence you in, in your, in your worldview, in your green view? Sure, Craig. First of all, thank you for having me on your program. Well, when I grew up, of course, that was the world that I knew. We were in a remote location in the eastern highlands rainforest of Papua New Guinea. So what that meant practically is that we were cut off from the rest of the world. There was a small airstrip. We had a garden, so we grew most of our own food. We also had a supply plane which would come in from time to time to deliver food. And we captured rainwater for drinking. Um, we, we called the roofs tin then. They were basically, uh, I believe, zinc-plated steel. And we had a, a large... Um, a large container for capturing rainwater. One of my jobs as a boy was to pump the water up into a smaller container on the roof, and from there it was heated via the wood stove at the right time of day so that we could have heated showers. Um, so what that meant to me was, um, I, I think it provided me with a little more awareness of where our basic necessities come from water, food, and uh, I, I grew up closer to nature than most people. It was very much a rural setting. Uh, and I played outside with my native friends. Uh, I spoke one language inside the home and another outside the home. So I grew up bilingual. And my friends were classified basically as, as Stone Age and in some areas pre-Stone Age, but they're very capable in their environment. Uh, the author, physiologist, um, Jared Diamond would visit our station. At the time he was an ornithologist, so he'd take a bag of rice and go up to mountaintop and, and study birds for great lengths of time. And Jared had commented um, at one point in his life that the New Guineans were the smartest people that he knew. And that's quite counter to what we see out of Hollywood, and what popular perceptions are of people who supposedly are not civilized and aren't as progressed as we are. So I, I grew up with that very strong grounding in nature and um, in a very tribal community where people actually looked out for one another. Uh, there wasn't this sort of... Um, oh, I would say, competition that we have in the States. Pacific Islanders are very friendly, they're very open. And having said that, they were also cannibals at the time of our arrival. So you get this apparent dichotomy where you have people who are dangerous and fierce on the one hand, but they're also polite and they're kind, and they look out for one another on the other hand. And that's how it is with a lot of traditional people. Um, they, if, if you come in friendship, you're treated well. So our soldiers in Iraq reportedly were taken aback by people offering them food, for example. They thought they were being poisoned. Um, so what's happened in our culture in the United States, I just want to touch on briefly, is that we're living in a climate of fear. The spirit of our time, the, the zeitgeist, if, if you will, is one which is highly repressive. And it's difficult for U.S. citizens who haven't traveled abroad, who don't have that same international perspective that I have, 
to really see what a mess we're in and how things could be better. So growing up on a Pacific island strongly influenced me. It made me a, 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 an ardent environmentalist. Um, I really do look at Mother Nature as being not just a commodity, a storehouse from which to grab materials, but as more of a, a living entity. And I'm concerned, and I've been running uh, for president to uh, advocate for tribal people, for indigenous people. And that's actually one of um, my lifelong uh, goals, my, my mission, if, if you will, in life, is to help traditional cultures survive the onslaught of our time. And so what that means is we need to learn to live sustainably and not just that so-called primitive peoples need to adapt. We are the ones who need to adapt and very quickly in the light of, um, of climate change especially. So I spent my first 10 years uh, overseas. My parents are both uh, American citizens. My father passed away uh, not too long ago. And uh, my mom's from Kansas and my father's from Colorado. So I am a natural born citizen. Birthers like to pick on that. Um, but I, I am qualified to run for president. And uh, it's just, it's been one long run for me. And what's behind me, I look at as largely being a warm up. Uh, I've made many friends within the Green Party leadership. People have seen me on the ballot more than once. And I get a pretty good draw um, come election time just based upon my reputation and what I've stood for in the past. In the California primary, the last time around, I received 11% of the green vote. And that's without really having a team put together, without being able to run full time, without sending out literature or making robocalls. And that was against a celebrity and our current front runner, Jill Stein, who has done a terrific job organizing. She's out there doing what I would very much like to do. But I, I work full time. I'm an air quality inspector for the uh, county air pollution control district. So in fact, I just put in a 10 hour day and raced here to set this up to, uh, to, to answer questions and to reach out to people to encourage you to uh, the, the listener to register green if you're not yet. This is a very exciting time to be a green and to help me with my campaign. I'll do as much as I can uh, evenings and, and weekends and I'll participate in ways like this. So tell, like. tell me how, you, how, how your job, since, since oftentimes uh, uh, Greens uh, go through a, a personal dichotomy in that they have to work in a corporate world or in a business world and then, and then there's their activist life. Now, your job is is green related, so uh, so your job experience is is very important because you have to deal with uh, uh, government agencies, bureaucracy, and the public at the same time. So, so talk to me a little bit about uh, what you see <coughs> in your job that's impacted impacted how you might approach running for president. Right. Uh, thanks, Craig. Yes, I'm an environmental regulator. In some areas, we're called enforcement officers. Uh, here, we're called compliance inspectors because what we do is we educate and basically enforce compliance. So I write tickets when I need to. Um, I prefer to educate people as to upcoming changes in the rules so that they aren't caught unaware. And when I inspect a business, the standard routine is to show up unannounced because we like to see how things really are going, not how the, uh, the manager or the business owner uh, would like us to believe it is. And uh, I've done this for 14 years. And uh, some of the fines that are settled can be pretty steep. These aren't parking tickets. Um, most um, are, are um, civil issues, not criminal, and those can be up in the six and seven figures. Uh, so uh, it's a job I take very seriously, and I, I see how nervous some people are when I show up. 
Uh, but for the most part, people really do try to comply. What I've seen is that people are really struggling. Um, I've gone to places where uh, one owner of a small business had a bedroom set up in, in one of the rooms at his business for he and his wife. He had adult children living at home. Uh, other people were holding on to long-term employees who were, are very much specialized in what they do. Uh, one of the uh, sectors that we regulate is automotive refinishing. Uh, because of the paint, the volatiles in the paint, which contribute to ground level ozone formation, which is basically uh, um, smog. So we're keeping the skies relatively clear by regulating the sources of air pollution. And I've, I've seen people come up with some pretty creative solutions. For example, taking 10% pay cuts across the board, in, including the owners who didn't need to do that to try to keep employees on board. I've seen managers with many years' experience being laid off in an effort to cost cut. So what's happening with the economy is something that I, I see very much on the job. And again, people really do try to comply once they know what the rules are. But as with many, especially on the conservative right slash wrong, many people do see regulation as being an unnecessary impediment. But because of our population and because we really haven't learned how to live in a full cycle, sustainable manner, we really do need to have regulatory agencies. And sort of preaching to the choir here to Greens who are listening. But for those who are more on the political right, they basically see our rules and regulations that help keep our air clean and our water clean as unnecessary impediments, which to me is quite disgusting. And then it's quite another layer beyond that to try to get people to really feel for the environment and for the, the spirit of the earth and to take a more, more uh, deep ecological or, or spiritual approach and to acknowledge, um, especially in, in sectors on the right, to acknowledge that this is a time that we really need to change things and that climate change, change is a major wake-up call. Um, I do think that we're past the tipping point, that things are going to get much, much worse before they get better. But that doesn't mean that we should lose hope. Uh, the solutions, the steps that we can take to be better prepared in terms of surviving the upcoming changes are also, by and large, changes that we need to make anyway. For example, improving the efficiency of our homes so we don't need to use as much fuel, thereby reducing our emissions output. Um, a lot of problems that we deal with as Greens are not given over to quick, simplistic, sound bite or sound bark, as Nader call it, solutions. They're intertwined and they're complex. And uh, it's difficult to really lay things out. Um, I do want to talk during this interview about how I set myself apart from other candidates and how my perspective let, let me think, ask you, help us. Uh, there's, yeah. there's something else in your background that I, that I find interesting. You, you, you list yourself as the, uh, as the past president of Turtle Island Institute. What, what, right. what is Turtle Island Institute? Because I'm curious about what your non... Uh, outside of your current job, uh, your past in, in terms of your green, greenish work. Uh, right. What did Certainly. you do in that capacity? What, did, what does or did Turtle Island Institute do, and what did you do in your capacity there? Okay. Um, certainly. Uh, first of all, there's more than one Turtle Island, and initially there was some confusion when I, I had mentioned this. Uh, we were a nonprofit, largely focused on border solutions. Here in Southern California, we are close to Mexico. So one of the plans that was put forward by Marguerite Hampton, uh, the uh, elderly lady who really uh, had the time and, and made this um, her project, and she's still doing related issues, was to come up with a plan for uh, the border region to uh, help both Mexico and the United States. And so a lot of it, uh, a lot of the work uh, was related to 
to networking, to social networking. And Marguerite is still doing that. Um, she is in touch with authors and scientists from around the world. Um, I know that um, Jill Stein has put together a, a green shadow cabinet and uh, I know many people and Marguerite knows many people who similarly could form a, I don't know, we could, we'd have to call it something else like a, a sunshine cabinet. Um, scientists and engineers and authors and that's really what Turtle Island led uh, to, is a, a network of people who really want to fix government <clears throat> and who want to fix our societal problems and know that there are solutions. That in between where we are right now and that solution set, we have corporations basically running amok and, and ruining things. So we really need to change the system that we're living within. <clears throat> Incidentally, uh, the term Turtle Island is a, a sacred term. It's an ancient uh, American Indian term that describes the continent. If you step back and you look at the continent, you see that it has uh, uh, flippers and uh, that uh, uh, it very much looks like a turtle. <laughs> and then the, the wisdom behind this is that um, turtles can float on the water and they can also sink. And so with what's happening right now, I, I think it's rather interesting in that island nations are at risk of going underwater with our rising sea levels. So the term also has uh, an ominous warning about it. Um, so uh, this continent it has the name Turtle Island. and It is a sacred term. Um, I'm interested in, in American Indian issues. Uh, my background includes um, the Blackfeet. That's part of my heritage. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> it's rather hot here in Southern California. Um, so what I, what I saw growing up and what I also um, have experienced later in life in traveling abroad is that uh, Nomadic people, native people, indigenous people <clears throat> really have little or no government. They, uh, they, they aren't supported adequately by the United Nations. The United Nations has a document on the rights of indigenous people. Um, unfortunately, uh, the acronym for that is DRIP, and we really need a deluge of support for traditional people. There's no enforcement. <clears throat> And the nations within which traditional um, indigenous people live also tend to not support them adequately. Uh, we have a shameful history here in the United States of how First Nations people were, were dealt with. Um, so I'm using the presidential run in part as a vehicle toward uh, improving representation and adequacy for indigenous people. Uh, what would you do regarding regarding uh, uh, indigenous lands, which were, you know, a, a, as you know, they, you know, not only have we have we have we stolen uh, the land from them, talk uh, about an oppressive peoples, uh, the United States history, mm -hmm. but we've also destroyed uh, what should have been shared resources. Uh, do you think uh, the indigenous indigenous nations uh, should have uh, greater sovereign control over their land? Should they receive more land uh, uh, reparations? Yes. Uh, or uh, I know there was uh, one group <coughs> that actually wanted to organize for a see it at the United Nations as sovereign lands mm -hmm. uh, to be recognized by both uh, the United Nations and the U.S. as, as, as sovereign uh, mm -hmm. or uh, and or uh, more rights uh, within the United States. I know that for, for example, the, I believe it's New Zealand where, where the, the, the Maori people actually get reserved seats for their parliament, 
guaranteed seats so that they are represented. Uh, what would be your solution for the, for uh, the indigenous uh, peoples in, in the United States? Yes, thanks for saying that, Craig. New Zealand is downright enlightened uh, in comparison to the United States when it comes to treatment of indigenous people. Uh, basically, what happened here in the States is that the original agreements, the contracts, were made with sovereign nations. The, the nations were seen as being independent nations with sovereignty. That was destroyed in, let's see, 1871 by the Indian uh, Appropriations Act, or one might say Misappropriations Act. And that basically stripped uh, all of the uh, First Nations people here in the, the states of their sovereignty status. Uh, from there we went uh, to a situation in the early 1900s, I think 1924 or, or so, with the Snyder Act, which made it clear that Native Americans were indeed U.S. citizens. Well, that was sort of a, a double-edged sword, because what's happened is the government, the U.S. government, federal government, quite conveniently uh, tries to classify uh, American Indians in whatever way uh, they can use to take the most advantage. So I, I think the appropriate treatment is to treat uh, people as being in sovereign nations. So here within the United States, we do have nations within our national border. That's, that's the appropriate way to, to deal with that. Now, in, in places like Brazil, uh, where there's an onslaught against the indigenous people uh, by the uh, Belmonte Dam and by other activity, illegal settlement, illegal mining, illegal forestry. And this is a problem worldwide. Uh, the argument of those who are so-called civilized is that the local people have a lot of land and they're not using it ad adequately, so it basically should be taken from them and their ways of life should be essentially rubbed out, which is what is happening. So genocide still is taking place around the planet. Another way, though, to look at such people is, is to step back and say, well, they're guardians. These people are guardians of what natural and biological diversity remains and they should be treated with respect and with courtesy and given title to their land and made that enforceable. I, I think many people know that here in the United States, the Supreme Court sided with the Cherokee and said basically that they could stay, but Andrew Jackson, of course, um, flew in the face of the Supreme Court and said, well, let them try to enforce that. And then after that, we had the Trail of Tears. Many people died. Um, so, really, the, the appropriate way is to, to treat such people as, as being sovereign and to um, interact with them on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. Uh, American Indians are, are not a minority. Uh, they are in a separate category, and they have not been treated well. In fact, just recently, uh, a couple of senators from... Uh, Arizona, McCain and the other one, his name escapes me at the moment, slid a rider into a must-pass bill. And riders are like parasitic attachments that are put on that don't receive much discussion at all. And so he bas these senators basically did a giveaway of sacred traditional Apache land to a major mining company from Australia, which... I believe it's going to be a, a large copper mine, which, which will just destroy the area. No regard whatsoever to traditional beliefs or these, these ancient cultures. And the argument now that people can use is, well, it's federal land, it's taxpayer-owned, so we basically own it and the U.S. government can do what it wants to. And that's the wrong approach. We need people in power. Uh, both politically and within corporations to be more understanding of the very unique situation that indigenous people have and the responsibility that they take uh, unto themselves to help not only protect and preserve their local environment, 
but to do work that helps with overall um, planetary harmony, to keep the balance that the Hopi and others have noticed uh, has fallen away. Koyana uh, Squatsi. Uh, um, over 50 years ago, the Hopi noticed that plants were blossoming, they were coming out of the, the ground, they were erupting at the wrong time, snow was still on the ground. Um, so something was very, very wrong. Now, when you get people, <clears throat> when you actually listen to people who are highly connected to nature, who, whose senses are attuned, and who can relate in ways that, that most Westerners can only dream of, they are basically like the early warning system, the canaries in the coal mine, if you will, um, especially regarding climate change. Climate change didn't just happen. This is a, a consequence of half a millennia of, of industrial, quote unquote, growth. It's a consequence of us treating the environment basically as, as a cesspool, as a, a dump, the air, the oceans, the land, as something that we can just keep tossing our, our, our garbage, our detritus, our pollution into. And so it's come back to bite us. So there's a lesson in this. Uh, the good news, though, is that we are standing on a precipice. We're on the edge of a cliff we, internationally. There's, there's no way around this. We have to address it. We have to address it. It, it is, to paraphrase uh, uh, Hans Blitz, Blix, former uh, United Nations weapons inspector, uh, this really is, climate change really is the World War III of our time. It's that serious of an issue. But the good news, the silver lining in that very dark storm cloud is that this can help to bring uh, unity to the, the peoples of our world. Uh, we really can learn to work together to put war behind us, to defund war, to make war so that it's not such a, a profitable enterprise, which it currently is. And we need to get away from being a nation addicted to war. Um, so when I first found the Green Party in 1995, when I was thinking of finding a party that resonated with my environmental values, I was really blown away by the, the breadth of the party. Uh, by the social justice aspect of it and the nonviolence aspect of it, which I have to say is strategic. Uh, we do believe in nonviolence and we ought to, not just for, for philosophical reasons, but in terms of strategy, when you're dealing with a, an Orwellian system that, that instigates, that uh, puts perpetrators into crowds to, to raise unrest, it's really good for us to take the higher road as a party and as a movement and to not resort to violence, to make it very clear that it's highly unlikely that people who are resorting to violence are, are green. So in that regard, it's strategic. So the Green Party really represents my values. I've been a Republican. Friends used to joke, well, you were a, a sheep in wolf's clothing because I tended to not vote very Republican. I've been a Democrat. And I, I realized back in the 80s that the parties at the top are very much alike. And so I, I like Rosa Clemente's way of putting it, that the Green Party is the imperative. And we're not just, I mean, as a party, we're the, the political arm of the social justice and environmental movements, but um, uh, there are Greens worldwide who are not members of parties. And uh, one thing in common is that I, Greens tend to be more connected to, to their place, to their locality, to the earth, and and they they understand the security aspects of, of growing more of one's own, own food, of knowing one's neighbors, and of solving problems locally, <clears throat> and and that's something that we don't get um, from the 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 parties of presumption, the uh, Tweedledum and Tweedledumer parties. There's not that understanding of the importance of place. And right now with our global environmental and economic crises, we really need to, to, to think and act in, in our neighborhoods. Um, so uh, I, I want to mention that I am a, an emergency shelter manager for the county of San Diego. Back in 2007, I was called up when the firestorms hit and I, I helped to run a local shelter. And that too was 
I think part of a reflection of, of climate change on a local level, why we've had so many firestorms in Southern California. So, so really, green issues are security issues. I, I mentioned earlier I wanted to touch on this. Um, I am interested in obtaining the green nomination. Uh, I'll have to get out there and run more full time, but I am currently a, a public servant, so I'm doing what I can. But it, for us to be successful, and I really do believe we have a, a, a shot at the White House. We, we really could have a green president. But for us to be successful, we have to use the language of our time. We have to reach out to people who are more conservative, those who are on the right, and present our issues in language that will gain traction. And that language is security. The, the powers that be have essentially ignored a major sector of our security, and that is our basic physical security. So we ought to be planning in terms of watersheds. We should be growing more of our own food. And when we do this, when, when we live more sustainably and locally, we're better prepared to meet emergencies. And as a nation, when we can learn to live within our means and not have to basically raid other nations for oil or what have you, then we'll be taking a higher road ethically as well. Um, so uh, I, I'm excited about what the Green Party is doing. Um, I'm not currently the front runner, but I, I think our front runner uh, is doing a great job. Um, at, at times, I'm, I've, I've been a, a, a little taken aback and that climate change you know, really was my issue back in 2004 when I brought it up. But what we do as Green Party candidates and as an alternative party is we uh, present ideas to the broader community that hopefully will be, will be run with. Uh, that's why we have a 40-hour work week and, and to uh, child labor, hopefully. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, suffragette movement came from that. Suffrage came from from these alternative movements, but I, I believe that the Green Party is powerful enough in our own right that we are ready uh, not just to, to take on uh, uh, positions as, as mayors. There are green mayors, there are green uh, politicians at different levels, uh, but we can have a, a green uh, senator, we can have a green president, um, but another thing that that green presidential candidates do is to talk about how we need to reform ourselves uh, politically to enact electoral reform, campaign finance reform, have more proportional representation. So we're really working within a, a very flawed system, even as we're trying to fix it, which makes it difficult. When, when Greens do get elected to higher positions, uh, largely it comes about because of some foul play or malfeasance on the part of one of the, the presumptive powers. So we, we take that opportunity and get Greens into office. So it's very difficult with the winner-take-all system and with the unfair ballot access rules to really get an alternative movement going. And the Green Party is doing a great job. Here in the United States, uh, as an overall political party from the start, we're over 30 years old, and um, we, we just, I, I mean, it, it ebbs and flows from election cycle to election cycle, but uh, in the, the presidential race, uh, we're, we're getting out there uh, earlier and more organized than ever before. So I'm doing what I can. I, I realize um, that, that um, well, I, I, I know that I'm not doing everything that I'd like to do, and it's very frustrating. It's just an issue of money. I have to work for a living. So I'm, I'm very pleased to participate in interviews such as this. Thank you. You, you, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, uh, reaching out to, to, to different people, the conservatives, for example. I know in, in my own experience, uh, uh, living in New York City, that... Uh, uh, the, the the urban conservative Republican is, is actually very different than 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 the conservative Republicanism you're seeing 
portrayed in the media across the country. My experience as, as a local environmental activist, uh, some of the strongest environmental activists were the conservative Republicans. And the reason why, as an urban conservative Republican, they were, uh, they are extremely concerned about overdevelopment, about the loss of green space, because uh, uh, consider what somebody who might be conservative Republican is facing. They have to spend ever more money for, for smaller and more expensive apartments and homes. Uh, the park space is gone, backyard space is gone, and, and, and in my experience, uh, in New York City, the real estate development is actually very much controlled by Democrats and liberal Democrats. So it's actually, luckily, the conservative Republicans are, are as strong or sometimes stronger environmentalists because they, they fight vehemently for more green space because it's the only place they can take their families. Uh, right. Th th they're they're in, in claustrophobic environments. And right. as much money as they make, uh, they find it uh, that they're having to spend it. They don't get to... It's funny. The, the, the cost of an apartment in New York, we were talking about this with my wife, uh, a studio apartment in my neighborhood is $600,000. A house wow. in my neighborhood, and this is Bushwick. Bushwick, wow. Brooklyn, which is considered a lower-income community. So you have people buying, uh, uh, spending two and three million dollars on apartments that are, that are barely a thousand square feet and, and no open space. And 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 the conservative Republican in New York is wondering where the heck is all their money going, and 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 the 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 the. the uh, how would I say is the synonymous, the synchronicity we have with Greens is that uh, there's also a strong desire because, because there's, their sense is the government is, is in New York City government is on the side of real estate, is mm -hmm. that there's strong components of, uh, of decentralization, of community mm -hmm. control, because right. when they have community control, they have control over preserving green space and development. Uh, because uh, I found in my in my own runs for state assembly in, 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 in city council that uh, I always, amongst addition to the progressive support, always had strong support in Republican, and there are not very large Republican components in New York City, It's but I've always had strong Republican support and was even at one time approached and said, would you like the line? <laughs> And as a green game, you know, the New York has fusion, yeah. and they were they were considering cross-endorsing me, and yet I would consider myself on the left. So I think there's a there's a, there's a concern about not pigeonholing ourselves, and while right. you may get uh, right. certain other conservative Republicans or not, but when you speak broadly, you may find you know thinking outside the box that there are constituencies that we may not think are natural constituencies, but are. So with that, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, okay. Since, since green candidates tend not to speak to that base, and you, you mentioned an awareness of that, what would you do? How do you approach uh, a, a Republican base or a conservative base and say, uh, you, you may want to evaluate where we're coming from because we're, we're not the same kind of left you might think of. <laughs> we're, right. We're, we're yeah. outside the box. Go ahead. Talk, yeah. talk a little yeah. bit about that. No, no. Absolutely. Um, one reason to run is to help define the Green Party and to, to help explain such things to people. Um, I, I do see commonality with people in unusual areas. Uh, you mentioned decentralization. Uh, that's, that's one area where we have overlap with, with libertarians and, and those who are more on, on the right. Um, with, with those who aren't um, rabid uh, right-wingers, there are those who feel a great sense of 
of personal responsibility. That's actually a conservative value. You wouldn't really believe it seeing what's going on in the world these days, but uh, personal responsibility is, is huge. Uh, I was thinking as you were speaking that uh, uh, Nixon, if you look at some of the things he did, I mean, he seems to be more of a Democrat than, than Obama in some ways. So we really shouldn't cut ourselves off from potential alliances. Uh, uh, here, here in, I, I just, I, wa I want to say that regarding um, the real estate industry, that, that's a problem that I think we're seeing in more and more places. It's certainly that way here in San Diego. I live in Encinitas, which is North County. It's north of San Diego. And there are five historic districts, if you will, in Encinitas. I live in Lucadia. And, and there's, there's this pressure from developers to put in more big box stores and to take away the, the character of this, this coastal town. And yeah, rents, rents are really high here. Property values are high here. I currently rent and I, uh, you know, I'm not getting as much as I'd like, but I, I like, I like the space. I've been here eight years. Um, Something needs to be done. I, I mentioned, I mean, so many ideas are swirling in my head right now, so chime in if you want to help keep me on track. But I mentioned food and water. Well, one of the other essentials that we have as humans is, is shelter. So we need affordable housing. We need to revisit how we look at housing. And, and one model that really works and is rather counterintuitive is that in a, in a way we need greater density. We need larger buildings that hold more people but have comfortable living spaces that open up into common areas. Uh, the, the hacienda, low-lying, single-story structure is, is comparable to that and that there are many different rooms that open into a, a beautiful courtyard where people can, can, can gather and, and mingle. Um, so we really need to address housing because uh, there, there really is enough housing to go along. I, I saw a statistic some time ago that for every homeless person, there are something like 24 empty houses. So it's, it's a matter of political will that's keeping us from housing people. But overall, in places such as New York and Los Angeles that have high density, I think what the future holds is to have high, higher density buildings, which we, we tend to... Um, we, we tend to rebel against, but uh, with appropriate architecture, they can let in light, we can have more open spaces, so you'll, you'll feel more like you're living in a larger area where the, the actual sleeping area may be, may be smaller. But we need to have leadership that's able to step back and, and to look at this for, for the good of all. Um, also beyond LEED, L-E-E-D, uh, we can have buildings, and there are buildings that are energy-producing buildings. That will really help us to have that sort of architecture, buildings that, that give more than they take. And, and I, I think overall, what, what I see as a problem, as a cultural problem, is that our cycles are too short. Our planning is, is much too short. If, if I were to be asked, well, in one word, state what our problems can be boiled down to. And I would say expediency. We're, we're basically rushing to get nowhere. Uh, the interest among corporations is to look at the next quarter returns rather than what happens in the next uh, quarter century. And with investment, it's certainly that way. Uh, a good trend in real estate would be to look at how the building is performing, uh, not just in the short term, but in the long term. So overall, we, we, need to, to, we need to hurry because of climate change. We, we need to speed up our responses. But in a certain sense, we need to take that front porch veranda approach and actually slow down and talk about where we're at and where we're going uh, because we're, we're in more of a, a rat race. We're, we're really on the edge of a, a 
a precipice, not just within this country, but internationally. And, and we can turn that around. Uh, so what I've been developing and what I've been talking about is that it's almost as though we need two economies, one that addresses purchasing power parity and the disparity across nations, uh, and, and then the other economy would be basically the, the boom and bust uh, economy that we currently have. So we, we need a higher social safety net, uh, maybe even two currencies, one that circulates locally and that isn't subject to hyperinflation, wherein even a wheelbarrow full of bills won't buy you a loaf of bread. We can avoid that, but we have to plan for that. And so we really need a, I'll call it a green market instead of a, a black market, and to do this internationally so that the same coin or the same uh, debit card or what have you would have the same value internationally. It also makes traveling easier. Uh, there would be local fluctuations in currency and local control, but basically we need to to have, and, and not, not just to, to cut down on the possibility of great social unrest and rioting, but we need a, a higher baseline uh, below which we say, no, we, we really shouldn't have that. I, I stepped over um, families sleeping on the sidewalk. I, I remember seeing a woman in her 70s who, who looked like my mother at the time sleeping on a sidewalk. And, and we call ourselves civilized. And we're really not. We, we can do better. We can do much better. So uh, I, I believe that the Green Party is the best vehicle there is to affect great social change and to safeguard the environment. And that if, if we reach that flashpoint in the U.S., which I think we're close to reaching, wherein we, we have masses of people spontaneously register green, and if we have a contested green primary, what that means is that uh, we'll have an abundance of resources and that we can pull from our different bases. So what I intend to do over the upcoming months is to nurture my relationships that I've, I've, I've grown over years with, with tribal members who tend to not trust outsiders and for good reason, to, to nurture those relationships and to bring, uh, bring more American Indians into the Green Party and to have more people with native blood run for office based on uh, seventh generation values, for example, that ecological wisdom, future focus that is in line with the Green Party platform. So that would be part of my contribution. Also, I have a PhD in the sciences. I'm just, I'm just disgusted with our, our politicians who, who totally dis science and, and seem to not have a clue as to the importance of, of climate change. The problem isn't that there aren't solutions. There are solutions. Um, Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek years ago, uh, when speaking at a college, uh, I recall, said that we have solutions to the pressing problems of our time, but basically what we lack is, is the willpower to enact those solutions. Green solutions work, but if you talk about demand reduction to a company that wants to sell you more and more widgets with a, a, a short life cycle, they're not interested in that. If you talk to pharmaceutical companies about us growing more and more of our own uh, medicinal plants, they're not interested, or to the agribusiness industry about us growing more of our own food, they're not interested. Their lobbyists aren't interested, and the politicians certainly aren't interested. So we need something like, really quite like a peaceful revolution. I, mean, I think it's right around the corner. Well, in that regard, uh, why do you think the public seems so unwilling or afraid to elect those people like you who could who could work towards making those changes why do people feel fear that or otherwise uh, uh, won't vote for that and and what right do you do to persuade them what what will you say to to convince them 
whether it's lesser evil voting, but I, I'll mention right. that even other countries that have winner-take-all elections mm -hmm. ha have been able to elect Greens to Parliament. So people, right. if persuaded, can break that. So what would you do to, to <clears throat> persuade them? Well, I, what I've been doing is breaking down the numbers. Uh, you see, there's there's a, a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there. Uh, people who want to maintain the status quo do that intentionally. So changing the language. For example, I overheard someone refer to uh, the D's and R's as representing both sides of the aisle. Well, that implies that everyone in the church or temple are D's or R's, and that's simply not the case. In Arizona, the major group, I believe, are independents. They're, they're not Democrats or Republicans. And uh, so looking at the numbers is very telling because um, that, that's not advertised on TV. No, no one pays to uh, teach about how we can become more civically engaged. Uh, so I got on the Secretary of State website for California and I looked at past performance. And what I found is that roughly a quarter of the people who could vote don't even bother to vote. So if you've got four people, one is out of the picture right away because they're not even registered. And if you're not registered, you can't vote. You've got to register in order to vote. Now, of those remaining, only half. Now, I'm only holding up about one and a half fingers at this point out of the four potential voters. Only half of those remaining three some 55% in California over recent election uh, turnouts even bother to show up at the polls during the more interesting election years, during the presidential election years. So 55% is pretty close to half. There's great opportunity uh, already for a, a valid, viable alternative party such as the Green Party. It's just that people don't know it. Um, one out of four people don't bother to register, and of the remaining three, only half bothered to show up to vote. So you get situations such as with the uh, current Secretary of State in California, where when someone gets into office with, say, 16% of what I would call the vote, the real vote, if you consider uh, those who are potentially eligible to, to register and to vote. So th there's great opportunity for growth. It's not like everyone's either a Democrat or a Republican. Um, and then to have the, the, persuasive, the persuasive cogent argument, uh, Nader used the expression uh, majoritarian issues, issues that affect all of us. And in, in part, uh, I think that inspired me to think in terms of what matters to all of us. And, and really, security is a key issue. I'm, I'm not just banding the term about, but we really have poor, basic physical security in the United States of America in terms of water and food and, and even shelter. Um, and, and we can improve that. And, and we'll get there when we have more local involvement, when we'll have more people not only having gardens to grow more of their own food, but, but sharing their food with neighbors, having more community gardens where people can intermingle. Say you're living in, a, in small cramped quarters such as you just mentioned. Well, if you've got uh, community gardens, then you can rub elbows with different generations. You can have grandparents with grandkids, and, and we can start to talk to each other again. Something nice that happened when we had a, our last power failure here in Southern California is that people actually went outdoors and got to know their neighbors. They lit candles. They talked to each other. Of course, we didn't know how long to go without, you know, before we'd, it'd be safe to open the fridge door. And, and that's one of the problems is the uncertainty. Do you leave your freezer door closed for two days, which, which probably would, would allow the food to be okay? You know, it's like, how long is that power failure going to last? How long are these emergency conditions going to be there? So when we get a double whammy, such as a firestorm uh, that happens at the same time as seismic activity, say a major earthquake, then the situation gets really, really interesting. So uh, I, I talk about emergency preparedness. I'm, I'm not really a prepper. I'm not as prepared as I, I ought to be. And I don't advocate just stockpiling cans of food, but we've got to think in terms of reinvigorating our local communities. And I think many people are. 
Um, a lot of people are disgusted with politics. That's actually good news for the Green Party, because if we can keep from our infighting, and if, if we can stop from attacking other potential progressive candidates and other parties, and if we can focus on being positive and presenting solutions, then we really can get the upper hand and have the last word. And I, I see that, you know, the ground is fertile for this, Craig. The people are ready, and we have a party that's, that's uh, been uh, digging the trenches of ballot access for, for so long. We have, you know, hardened party activists who are not about to let the Green Party fade away. The, the, in the Green Party, we're here to stay. That's something I've said for a long time. The party's here to stay, and we're here to stay on this planet with sensible solutions that make sense. You know, um, uh, single-payer health care makes sense. It's cost-effective. Um, I was listening today about uh, uh, issues regarding uh, the... Uh, uh, regarding Uber and regarding our current uh, economy in which uh, people are making money whichever way they can but they Explain don't really what Uber is oh U Uber is a uh, it's basically a an application wherein one can get a ride instead of calling a taxi and you're basically riding in someone's car so someone who is nearby who is an Uber driver uh, can take you where you need to go then the driver makes some money and the, the company makes some money. There's also another, I think, called Lyft, L-Y-F-T. Well, the thing is, and the, the real issue is that these people are seen as being independent contractors, even though there is the overlap uh, regarding their requirements, such as maintaining their vehicles, etc. Overlap with the old school way of doing business, which basically says, if, if, you're, um, if, if you're running such a business that uh, you, you really need to... to to provide more for, and, and treat the person as somewhat of an employee. Um, I, I think what we need to do is to have more basic services available, uh, such as um, uh, single-payer health care, and, and then that, that provides a benefit so that people don't have to make their money uh, to pay for expensive insurance. If you grow more of your own food, you don't have to spend so much on healthful organic produce because you're growing it and also it's very healing. It's healing to the earth and it, it's healing to the soul really to, to get one's hands and one's feet in, in, in good dirt, in, in the good earth. And it, it's grounding for children too who are in front of electronic devices to actually get out there uh, and, and be engaged in, in something more productive. Um, so, I, I'm not saying that we have to become a, a nation of small farmers, the Jeffersonian ideal, but we really need to have more of a balance of technology and, and nature and, and more primary experiences. I was thinking of that term uh, in regarding presenting what, what I'm talking about, because so much of what we do is in terms of um, roundabout ways of getting what we need and what we want uh, to work for, say, X company so that we can get Y product from Z company, etc. So if we have more home-based um, industries, more cottage industries, more support of, of local services and more distributed services, uh, we'll be, be better off. We'll be better off not just during times of emergency, but we'll have a, a more robust economy overall. And that's what people do anyway when, when they're stressed. Uh, you don't send your kids off to expensive daycare. You talk to your, your friends and neighbors who have similar needs, and then everyone basically pools their, their children, and different people look after the kids. Um, it, it's also difficult for the government to tax. So I, I really encourage that, that we come up with our own non-taxable solutions, because you know, our current federal government is highly wasteful. And on that note, back to touching base with people who are more on the political right, there are those who are more to the right of spectrum who really believe that we need an independent auditing system for the Pentagon. If we could really cut our military waste even by a fraction, that alone would support major social programs such as our military spending. Um, I, um, 
I was presented with the idea of the Green New Deal back in about 2004. I put it on some campaign literature in 2008. Um, our current front runner has run with the Green New Deal. And I, I am an advocate for the Green New Deal, except with the caveat that we need more local control. And when I looked over um, the position paper as written, I, I saw that uh, uh, there were uh, considerations made for, for local control. And I'd, I'd like to think that maybe I had some role in, in helping that language come about. But regarding cutting military spending by 50 percent, that's just not going to happen. Uh, our Congress isn't going to allow that. And the businesses that profit enormously uh, from our, our war machine and our ongoing war addiction certainly don't want that. So we have to talk about transformation. And we can do that. We can transform more into uh, strengthening the National Guard and actually having another branch. It wouldn't be the military per se, and it would, would uh, enact nonviolent measures, but would be focused on, on real security and would address international problems and help with climate refugees. We currently have no way to deal with climate refugees in a way that's compassionate and in a way that really makes sense. So there's a lot to do. There's a lot to do in this country and there's a lot to do internationally. So it, it's good to uh, to spread these ideas around. I, I do plan to be at the annual national uh, meeting next week in St. Louis and I look forward to rubbing elbows with with other party leaders and uh, I really would urge everyone to uh, to to uh, support our various candidates. Uh, it's not going to be a coronation. It, it really will be a contested primary. Uh, the first two signatures I received electronically to participate in the presidential forum were from others who were also uh, seeking the, um, the presidency via the Green Line. Daryl Cherney, who was on uh, your program last week, and I, I did watch it. I just remained silent. Uh, during the program, but I, I found him to be a, a very interesting person. And then Bill Kreml also reached out to me as well. And earlier today, I, I stopped uh, putting it off. I've had so many other things to do. So I, I posted, and I'm getting electronic signatures coming in, so uh, I should make it to the forum. And as a fallback um, at the annual meeting, I was informed by the PCSC uh, by Rich Satolo that I can actually collect signatures. I, I think 32 while there, which I really don't want to do. So that's coming along. I'm actually in the early stage. Yeah, I should, I should mention to, yeah. to the people watching <coughs> sure. that uh, mm -hmm. we have, a, a, as of the day of this live stream, there will be uh, an annual national meeting of Greens <coughs> coming up in about a week, and there will be a candidates forum uh, of, of uh, our presidential candidates, those who are seeking uh, seeking our nomination, a and there's a sense, that, uh, as Kent is mentioning, that uh, we're in this together, and and having a diversity of candidates results in a, in in a discussion that right. uh, involves not only involves more greens uh, uh, because they discuss when they hear the candidates discuss that that the public when they get the opportunity to see that we have uh, that there's that there's a diversity of green thought and a diversity of expression uh, that they have motive to to pay attention to us because there's a there's there's a there's a misconception about third parties I feel that somehow a third party is a monolithic thing, whereas the Republicans and Democrats are are, are, are big tents, so to speak. A and uh, Greens have a diversity of thought, and seeing a diversity of candidates, and not only the interaction with with Green voters and non-Green voters as they listen, but the green candidates themselves uh, can develop a kind of a, a ca catalyst, which, mm -hmm. uh, which in which the outcome will be a a, a better versed and more diverse.
green candidate because eventually there'll be a nominee, but that nominee will have been informed by uh, a collective can a collective candidate experience that the right. running for president within the Green Party is in itself a a collectivist experience, a, a group effort not only amongst the 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 members but a group effort amongst the candidates to help uh, uh, inform and, and develop each other's thinking because uh, each one during this long primary process uh, and caucuses and state conventions uh, each one uh, is in effect a spokesperson a person each presenting green thought to the public. Uh, so they get a broader sense of what green is. and it, All the green candidates are green candidates. That's important. Uh, right. And diversity is a green key value, so we'll see that at play. This way we can broaden our base. And again, we really need to stay away from, from bickering. And overall, as a party, I, I think we do that. Uh, those who have really been slogging it out uh, within the green leadership uh, and who, who get tired, I, I think, um, uh, are reinvigorated by, uh, by such meetings as we'll have. And uh, yeah, we, we, we can find that, that safe space or that sacred space, that overlap in the Venn diagram with other movements and other constituencies. And indeed, I think this is, is what we'll see in part in, in Missouri, uh, is that uh, we'll have more, uh, more uh, African Americans involved in the party uh, because they'll see what we're really about. And again, I intend to bring uh, more American Indians into the party, uh, but my my focus isn't so much on social justice issues. Uh, that's that's more what other candidates have done. Cynthia McKinney in 2008 and Jill Stein in, in 2012. Um, but rather uh, uh, focusing on 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 climate change and and how we we, we really need uh, to unify. Uh, because this this really is a serious threat, and it, it can help unify our entire world if we we pull together in that regard. So yes, yeah, yes, yeah, social justice issues are important, but uh, I I get good marks for being an environmentalist, and part of that comes from how I was grown, how I was raised, where I grew up, uh, in a, a tropical rainforest. Uh, with no roads to outside settlements, we were really cut off, and that that also inspired me to think independently. And I I really do believe that there's overlap with with um, those who are concerned about uh, the long arm of our national security agencies. There's overlap with with uh, these people, with libertarians and and others on the political right who who see that. Our, our corporate government has really gone too far and that the pendulum needs to swing back the other direction. Uh, so again, yes, there is much diversity within the Green Party and we do learn from each other as candidates. I learned a lot from David Cobb back in, in 2004 and Move to Amend is still going and it's, it's still going uh, strong. Uh, we really do need to amend the Constitution to make it clear that a corporation is not a person because what's happened now is corporations are legally seen not as just being people but they're basically supersized people and, and not just a, a person with a soul but they're basically psychotic individuals so that, that really ought to be dealt a, a serious blow and move to amend is, is out there and doing good things thanks to David and others. Um, I'm involved with the Pachamama Alliance, a, a nonprofit organization. Uh, Pachamama basically means uh, Mother Earth and this is in, in Ecuador and uh, there are allegiances with, uh, with, other, uh, with other countries but one thing of interest is that uh, move to amend is seen sympathetically by 
the Pachamama Alliance, and I think by others who advocate for indigenous rights, because part of the problem with what's happening with Native people is it's the corporations that come in with, with their guns and their, their tools and, and their politicians and just eradicate ways of life. So, yes, Republicans in New York and also uh, rainforest dwellers as well are besieged by corporations. And we really can't let corporations rule the world uh, with the tip of the hat to David Corden. Uh, nor are corporations necessarily evil, but they really lack values and, and they really lack a, a soul. And they certainly shouldn't be deemed um, uh, legally as being people. And that alone, when we address that issue, will allow um, solutions to come to the forefront, solutions that are ready and waiting to our the, the pressing issues of our time. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you, Kent, for... for joining us tonight and uh, uh, next week at the Green Annual National Meeting. Uh, we may live stream it, but even if we can't, we will record it and post that online. So uh, shortly after that, uh, we'll be hearing uh, more from, from you and, and the other uh, candidates. And, and this, this show, uh, Alternative 2016, will continue. Uh, interviewing candidates and uh, uh, quite possibly having candidates come back as the can as their campaigns progress for more discussion so that greens who can't make uh, events in person can can see these things online get to know uh, you and the other candidates uh, as you you know there's there's uh, often a candidate that may be more visible than the others, but the others are just as important. And and our job uh, as the Green Party Media Committee and as this uh, GPUS TV is to make sure that not only Greens but the public are aware uh, of who our candidates are. Uh, that uh, we are a resource to make sure your voice is heard as a candidate. Well, thank you for being here, Kent. Uh, uh, we'll be hearing from you and the other candidates next week and uh, and in subsequent weeks uh, as we disseminate this information. Uh, it was good introducing yourself to, to, to those of us out in, in the viewing public. Thank you, and thank you for having me on the program. Uh, you and Starlene are doing really good work, and I, I do appreciate this. I, I think it's good for people to hear different stories and different sides of, of the same story. Uh, I think this uh, could be the most interesting green presidential election season yet, and uh, I, I really look forward to our nation uh, learning to live sustainably and to us uh, affecting the solutions that are out there uh, that are just waiting for the right moment. And, and the moment is now. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for having me on your program. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you, Kent. So for those uh, new to the process of, of, uh, of a Green Party presidential campaign, yeah, uh, just like other parties, we have uh, multiple candidates, and we have uh, uh, over 20 ballot lines already. Uh, and according to the various state laws, they will have uh, either public uh, primaries uh, with party members voting, uh, caucuses, or state conventions. Uh, so, as a Green member. Uh, you will have an opportunity uh, to hear from our candidates, as you have tonight, and participate uh, in selecting uh, the candidates. And each, can each state will have different rules as to how delegates will be allocated. And in those states that don't have ballot lines, uh, there will be petitioning efforts uh, to put the Green Party on the ballot. Uh, that is already uh, underway uh, in states that allow it uh, in 2015 for 2016. We have uh, a ballot access committee who 
is working with various states on petitioning and otherwise meeting the ballot access requirements because the more ballot lines we can accrue uh, before 2016, uh, the uh, easier it will be to get the additional ballot lines in 2016 for our candidates. And uh, since the Green Party has started running presidential campaigns uh, in 1996, we have always been on the ballot in the majority of states, uh, uh, oftentimes uh, in the range of upper 30s to mid 40s. There are some states that are extremely difficult, uh, unfair ballot access laws. But generally, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the country uh, will be able to vote green in in the general election. Uh, so. Uh, with with that, uh, it is possible with the raising of consciousness that a green could could get enough votes to to win uh, the electoral college. And uh, I think one of the electoral misconceptions people have is you must get a majority to win. Well, you need a majority of the electoral votes, but uh, in all but two states. Uh, the the electoral votes are are plurality winner take all. So if there are four presidential candidates on the ballot, uh, uh, because the libertarians will also make the ballot in as many states as the Greens do, uh, it will be potentially a mathematically possible for a Green to win. Uh, the, the electoral votes of a given state with a little over 25 percent or in a three-way a little over 33 percent of the popular vote in a given state. So when we talk about winning the Electoral College uh, that's actually uh, winning the majority of electoral votes in states in which a Green candidate, Green presidential candidate, could conceiv conceivably do that with as little of as 25 plus 1 to 33 plus 1 percent. So mathematically it is possible if our voice is heard and if the public gets over their fear of voting for Greens, it is possible to elect a Green. When they say, when you hear people say Greens can't win, well actually mathematically they are decisively incorrect. <laughs> Greens can win. The, the, the only thing that prevents Greens from winning uh, is, is the consciousness of the public and, and, and their willingness to vote Green and their willingness to overcome the issue of voting for the candidates that spend the most money. If you don't want a corporate candidate elected, all you have to do is vote for a candidate of a party that is not corporate funded, like the Green Party. That's really all. You just have to be willing to do it. So, uh, and, and that extends all the way on down through the Senate, Congress, uh, and state legislatures, and even local council races. Uh, the the on the one hand, proportional representation would be ideal, but understand that in a winner-take-all election, it only takes a plurality to win. And in the United Kingdom, uh, when Caroline Lucas won, she won with only 31% of the vote when she, when she won her MP seat. Uh, and when Elizabeth May won her, her, her seat in Canada, it was also with under 50% of the vote. So, so the mathematics are there if uh, about one-third of the population make, make that commitment and develop that, that level of consciousness to say, I'm going to vote Green uh, and, and put a kibosh to Greens can't win. Uh, and once again, uh, I'd like to thank Ken Mesplay for being here uh, tonight and uh, uh, wish him the best of luck. And we'll be talking to, to Kent again in, in the near future. You'll be hearing from him probably 
uh, next week live or recorded uh, from the Anglo National Me National Meeting. So good night, everyone, and and good night, Kent. <laughs>